Hey everybody, welcome to today's podcast. This is going to be all about activation. Activation strategies and activation in general are one of the secret components that startups have to really move users from passive users to engaged customers. There's a lot to unpack with activation. And today I'm mostly going to focus on what activation is and some ways to hopefully help you think about how to leverage constraints to think about your pricing and other components that go into your activation strategy. Stay tuned. I think you'll have a lot of fun with this episode. Thanks. All right, so I often get asked, what is activation? Well, in my view, activation is a process by which you help push users through the customer journey. And by default, activation is a very active state of mind. It's not a passive thing that you just kind of lob out there and put in front of users at any given time. So activation is a big, broad concept, but it's really meant to get users to do the actions that you really intend for them to take. And look, you have to work at this. You can't assume that your customers are just going to come in and know everything about you and just magically move through the customer and buyer journey. That just doesn't really happen until you get to a certain stage where you figured it all out. So again, activation is the process by which you uncover value to walk that user through that customer journey. Now, this is a very broad concept. So activation, in my view, spans things like product-led growth, onboarding, email marketing, upselling, cross-selling, landing pages, triggers, hooks, and a whole bunch more. So if you think about where your product team sits, building product, and where your marketing team maybe ends in terms of driving awareness and visibility of your brand and leveraging customer acquisition, activation is that entire piece in between. But it doesn't necessarily start or stop there either. I've seen great activation-focused team members go all the way up into top of funnel messaging and advertising because they really understand what the customers want and need. And I've also seen them move way into product land and and really get in deep with product discovery and product value creation. So when we think about activation, there's really kind of a, a concept that I want to introduce to you that I call the endpoint acquisition goal. And then we'll talk about a couple stages of activation. So with customer acquisition, your general focus is to get people aware of your brand and to get them actively engaging with your brand. And so by default, when you're running customer acquisition campaigns and strategies, you really should have an end point or a handoff point between that level of awareness over into the product itself. And I call this the endpoint endpoint acquisition goal. And usually this is the last step of any customer acquisition process. So to shorthand, I call this EPAG. And activation will actually start with the endpoint goal that we're basically taking a handoff from marketing and then moving into the product with. Now, look, it's not always linear. Uh, I don't always think about growth in terms of a growth funnel or even as a set of growth loops. I think you're going to do a little bit of both, but I think you will find that, especially as you're just getting started, your early efforts are going to be linear focused, meaning you have to figure out how to drive some level of demand, and then you have to figure out how to leverage that demand to actually drive conversions from. And so activation kind of lives in that space. Once you kind of understand what that handoff is going to be, And the handoff typically is that your product gets a product-led lead, or you've captured an email address, or somebody signed up for a free trial, or they filled out a contact form. Ideally, they're using the product. Those are all the endpoint acquisition goals that kind of call it marketing will hand off to product and and to growth. There's multiple stages of your activation loop as well. And so there's kind of two components to consider here. One I call next step activation, and the next after that is called endpoint activation. So think of your next step activation as a growth loop where each and every touch point with your user or customer has a place in time 
and has a definitive amount of value that you can quantify against that step in the process. And think of your end goal as being the thing that you want the user to do. So what's the end of the customer journey state? And for most of us, that's going to be a revenue metric. And so, but it's hard to think about a revenue metric when we think about this life cycle of the customer, because there's a lot of things that we may need to do before we even see revenue, especially as you move up market and are at larger kind of enterprise offerings. If you're in the consumer space or if you've got a low cost B2B model, that's a subscription, for example, $50 a month and less, your pathway to going from kind of awareness to paying user could be quite quick. If you're moving up market and selling to enterprise, that could be a lot longer. And so if we were to think about an, an activation loop, really we start with customer acquisition. Then we hand it off to our first step of activation, which is called our endpoint acquisition goal. Then we move to our second step of activation, which might be they've engaged with your product in one or more ways. And then we may have a third or fourth or even a fifth step that is product driven or product led or potentially sales assisted or marketing assisted where you're expecting that user to do things before they become a paid user. So all of those form this activation loop, ultimately with the end goal of whatever that metric you're going to really track from activation is going to be. And again, we call that the end goal activation step. So there's a few things here that I think are really, really, really important to consider when we're looking at activation because it is such a broad concept. So number one, when you're just getting started with activation, or maybe you've been doing it for a while, but aren't organized around it, have an understanding of the metrics that you need to own at each and every step of that activation journey. So if we want to think about it as a, as a loop, well, how many steps along the loop are there? And what are the things that you have to do in order to move that user through that loop? Then what you need to do is you have to relentlessly focus on each and every one of those stages. So I'll walk through an example of how Miro does this, I think in a, in a world-class way in a second. But what you'll notice with the fast growing, especially the mid-market SaaS companies and consumer companies is they let the product do a lot of that work to move the user through that activation loop. This also means that you have to be very intentional about what you're putting in front of your user or buyer along that journey. So if you're just spamming them with uh, just non-relevant content and weird things in the product, or you overwhelm them with exposing them to too much product too soon, or you're putting kind of enterprise level features in front of a consumer-based client, it's just going to confuse them. You really have to be strongly intentional at each and every touch point you have with the user, literally every touch point. And this goes from the ad that they see or the messaging that they engage with through that first exposure with your brand, through the activation loop that you've built. Each and every one of those touch points is an opportunity for you to either shine or to blow it. And I've just seen so many scenarios of really bad activation. I'll give you one example. You need your user to fill out a form to sign up. And then it takes you three days to get back to them for a sign up. Or let's say you're going more product led and you have a free free trial or somebody can kick the tires in your product and you instantly let them create an account and they get in and they get confused and they go away. Well, if you're not sending emails and you're not reaching out to try to engage them to understand why they left and why they're not coming back, you're likely going to fail. So that's what I mean by intentionality. The next step is really, I think where a lot of the magic is, each and every one of you has psychological and product leverage that you can put against your user based on the value that your product can bring to the table for them. And in this scenario, once you understand what those levers are and kind of what that leverage is, you're going to be able to put together triggers that help you speed up or make more fluid that activation process that you've got either in a funnel or a loop. And I'd say the last component here is don't expect 
the product just to do all of the work for you. I think that's actually a very lazy approach. And, and I think those of us that are really heavily into product-led growth understand the pitfalls of going too deep into pure product-led growth. I've had countless conversations with founders who in 2021 or 2022 really invested in, in PLG and then realized that once they took the manual human components out of the process, everything went to hell. And it's no surprise, right? Humans tend to like to engage with other humans, especially as your price point gets higher. So if you've gone entirely product-led and you've seen a dip in your metrics by pulling humans out of the mix, consider putting humans back into the mix. The other thing here though, is that with that in mind, you likely have to be multiple places. And what I mean by that is that you have to be effectively everywhere where your customers are so that you remind them of your value. And if this is not one and done, you don't just get somebody into your product and the product just magically works 100% of the time. You likely have to run ads and send emails and do customer discovery and do outreach and yes, have an amazing product. Okay, so some examples of uh, what causes poor activation, I'll get into a few of these. Number one is lack of measurement uh, and lack of clarity on what your goals are. So if you don't know what you're measuring or why you're measuring it, it's going to be really hard for you to quantify where you're being successful and where you're totally failing with activation. And so be very mindful of that. I think the second piece is really around proactivity with the user or the buyer. And again, I mentioned things like email outreach and uh, in running ads, you just have to do a lot of work to not only acquire, but to retain this customer. It's likely you're in a competitive space. So the user's probably shopping around and yeah, you may have a really great product, but guess what? If a competitor offers that same value for cheaper, they're probably going to churn. And it doesn't really matter that your brand is strong and everything else works. You're going to have to work to acquire and retain that customer. And the pitfall that I see with a lot of product-led and activation-led companies is that they just expect the process to magically work and they don't really push the user through that process. And so again, you have to be intentional about that. Conversely, I've seen a lot of scenarios where, where what we build is actually way too rigid. So we come in with a point of view on what we want the user or buyer to do. And, and we're like, we're not going to deviate from that plan. Well, this is a real world things change, market impacts user behavior, financial situations change how your buyers think about your product, your value against competitors becomes important. So if you build too rigid of a process, you're also going to fail. So you have to find the sweet spot between being completely loose and not having a strategy and plan and being way too rigid with a process that may be uh, too constraining for, uh, for you to really grow. And lastly here, one of the biggest um, challenges that, that I've seen with poor activation are when founders just kind of get lazy or when marketing teams or product teams kind of get lazy because things are working. You need to operate as if the world's biggest competitor is going to come on the stage tomorrow. And if you bring that mindset into work every day, then you'll probably stay ahead of it. But we've been caught blindsided by competitors and even other market conditions and things like that. Do not expect this process that you put in place one time to be what works in three months, six months, or a year. What you put out there today may not even work in a week. So just be ready for rapid, rapid iterations and to move quickly there. And focus on those metrics that matter, have a well-defined process, and you should be uh, really good to go. So now I want to get into an, a very specific example of uh, a company, Miro, that I think does a really, really phenomenal job of bridging the gap with both their product-led growth, their advertising, and activation. And so for those of you that are watching on video here, I'm going to share my screen, but I'll walk you through what we're looking at. So I'm going to use Miro as an end-to-end -end example. And so when I'm on Twitter, I may see an ad for Miro that showcases the value of the product. And they've got kind of a whimsical, fun uh, set of creatives and branding that they put out there. And their whole value prop is that you can start a whiteboard and you can collaborate online. You can be creative, you can be productive from anywhere. 
in this, this product is a collaboration tool. So everything they do from a branding perspective, number one is consistent and it's very strong. What happens is when I see an ad for Miro on Twitter, I start an acquisition and then an activation loop where my input, say I see their ad on, on Twitter, is that I'm browsing product management themes on Twitter and then I see an ad for Miro and then I click the link. And then what they're focused on, their end point acquisition goal, what their marketing and product teams want me as a user who saw that ad to do is go over to their website and sign up for a free trial. So their ad looks great on Twitter. I click it, it brings me over to a landing page that matches the look and feel of the ad itself and is just phenomenal. The messaging is straightforward. The graphics look great. I even like the font and I like the color scheme. Okay, so there's consistency right there. So they're putting in a lot of work to connect what they're doing top of funnel to what they're doing kind of middle of funnel with this activation loop that they're about to build. And now when you go on their homepage, you're going to see things like high level value props. So be creative from anywhere, be productive. You're going to see examples of their product in use. You're going to see social proof, all the brands that use them. You're going to see messaging around helping you do better, spend more productive time. They're calling all pioneers who want to become leaders in this collaboration space. And then they say, join the 7 million other people that happen to use Miro. And they are relentlessly focused on doing one thing with that page. And what that one thing is, is to get me to sign up for their free trial. So this is their product-led initial piece of their growth loop for activation. Then what they do is actually where I think it gets really, really interesting. So look, creating great ads and landing pages, that's great. You should do that. But look at how Miro leverages triggers and user psychology with constraints to make it almost a no-brainer for me to sign up. They've actually got a multiple part sign-up flow. So you don't just click a button and you're automatically into Miro using the product. Step one is they say, get started for free today. Put in your name, put in your work email and a password. And these are all required fields, by the way. You agree to their terms of service and then you can get started now and move to the next step. Or they let you sign up with Google, Facebook, Slack, and I think um, another, another uh, application that you can use to sign in some kind of single sign in platform. Okay. So that's step one. Step two. Now, again, they're not getting me into the product yet. So they're putting some friction up here. They say, set up your team. What's the team name? What is your role in the company? And what's your company size? Is it only you? Is it, are you 20 to 50 people, 51 to 250, 250 to a thousand employees, 1000 to 5,000 or 5,000 plus? Well, what are they doing here? They're qualifying you. So they're putting you into the right bucket so that they can then build onboarding in a personalized manner. If, you, if it's just you going through this process versus you're an employee at a 5,000 person company, your use case and expectations of the platform and even the way you perceive value is likely going to be different. And Miro has thought through all of this stuff. They also allow me to tag anybody with the same email address in my domain to sign up really, really easily so that they speed up this activation process. Now I click set up and continue. The third step in their process is that they ask you to invite teammates. You can invite from Slack, you can invite from Google Contacts, you can copy and paste a link to share in your work messenger, or you can actually put multiple different email addresses in on who you want to invite into the project. Now this is really, really, really critical. So again, they've slowed down onboarding. They've made it actually pretty hard for you to sign up. But the, but the interesting thing is they're using user psychology with a constraint and a trigger. And specifically what they're doing is they're saying, hey, get a bunch of your team members in here and collaborate with them. And we're going to make that really easy for you. Okay. Well, what happens next is that I go through their onboarding and they ask me, what do I want to do? Do I want to set up a meeting and workshop? Do I want to do research and design? So they've got all these different options that they put together with onboarding. So I choose one of those. And then what happens is they present me with a bunch of template options. I choose a template that I want to get started with. And I'm now in the product using it. Well, guess what? I got through that project through onboarding and now I'm into Miro using it. 
by the time I got through that process, I created one what's called board, which is the core usage of the product. Miro sells their seats based on how many boards and people you have working on a project. So I already created a board, but through their onboarding, because they slowed it down, I probably also invited a teammate, which means that the teammate then goes and gets the onboarding email, is invited in to create an account, and they go through that same process where at the end they create a board. Now myself and my first invited teammate have created boards. Now let's say my teammate invites our designer in. They go through the process. Now there's three people in, three boards have been created. At that point, we are out of the free trial and bumping up against their paid plan. Because once you get to three boards and or three users, and look, for your projects and your uh, products, this is gonna be completely different how you think about this. But for Miro, because of the way they sell, they've built onboarding to speed up the fact that you're gonna bump up against their constraint. So yeah, it's world-class in terms of leveraging product-led growth to get you through this activation loop. But they're really, really sophisticated stuff comes in where they bump you up against that constraint and then they get you to upgrade to the paid plan. And so what they've done is they've built a growth loop with you, with you and your team to get you into their product and using their product. And again, because you can only have three boards living at once, you're going to invite your teammates and your teammates are going to invite teammates and you're just going to go through this process. And at the end of the day, they're going to upsell you and cross sell you on all of the benefits that Miro can bring to the table for bigger teams. If it turns out it's just you, you can still use the project. You can still use the product. But if it's you and 15 other people, They've got an enterprise plan that you can buy into. They've got team collaboration, things that you can purchase. It's really incredible how they leverage those constraints to basically lock you into using the product and then to get you to a point where you're using it with your team and then you're bumping up against that pricing model. And so that's how uh, that's how some of the best companies will will handle onboarding. But in the case with Miro, they don't stop. At that growth loop. They continue the loop by sending me emails. They send me a weekly digest. They have a customer discovery email that goes out. They email me on a weekly basis. At the starting point, they send me plans and pricing information. They send me emails about onboarding. I mean, they're just relentless. And what that does is it really pushes me to constantly be thinking about them. And my teammates are getting emails from them now. And now we're talking about Miro and Miro becomes part of our daily life and we bump against our seat limit and then we move up from a you know free plan to a team plan to a business plan to a company plan and, and all of a sudden we're spending hundreds of dollars a month with them. So those are the steps to to how great companies leverage activation. And so hopefully I've given you some context here in terms of how the pros do it. Uh, so whatever you're working on now, think about it from the lens of where am I providing value? What are the metrics I need to go after? What are those steps in the activation growth loop that I have to think about and put together for me to be wildly successful with activation? So I hope you enjoyed the show. I will get into product-led onboarding and other activation topics on a future show. There's a lot of stuff here to dive into, but that should cover some of the basics. Reach out to me with any questions. And uh, if you like this episode, please leave me a review and send any questions you've got my way. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.